Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the fifth meeting of 2015 of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee. Before we move to the first item on the agenda, I remind everyone present to switch off mobile phones as they may affect the broadcasting system. Uh, some people may be using tablets, etc., for the purposes of the meeting. That's um, the only reason for having them on. Um, we have no apologies today. And agenda item one is a decision on taking business in private. First item is for, business, uh, for members to consider whether to consider agenda item four, consideration of responses from local authorities on the disposal of assets in private. I invite uh, members to agree. Agreed. Are we agreed? Thank you very much. Agenda item two is the dairy industry. And uh, <clears throat> the second agenda item is for the committee to take evidence on the dairy industry from stakeholders. We have two panels this morning, the first of which is comprised of representatives of major retailers. We will have more tomorrow. And um, uh, the uh, members will have uh, the background papers. And I'd say good morning to our panel who've come at uh, fairly short notice to us. Thank you very much for that. It's very helpful. Um, Ewan MacDonald Russell, who's the Scottish Affairs Advisor for Morrison. Uh, Andrew Loftus, the Agriculture Manager for Morrison's. And uh, Chris Brown, the Sustainable Business Director of ASDA. Good morning to you. Um, gentlemen, um, can I, a two-part question about prices at the beginning, I think, to kick off. What farm gate prices do you pay for your milk? And uh, do you pay this to all farmers or just to those in a select group or pool? Does anyone want to start? To, to do sorry, it's, it's automatically yeah, the okay. same. Very good. So, um, as to su it's supplied by Arla, um, the farmers cooperative, they supply us with all of our liquid milk, cream and cheese. Uh, the current price that Arla are paying is 24.87 pence per litre for a standard litre of milk, which, for the committee's information, is 3.3% protein, 4% fat. Um, that being a standard, about 30-40% of their producers, I understand, are in exceedance of that, and some of them will be, because of the composition of their milk, receiving a price of nearly 27 pence. I would emphasise that that's the price that Arla pay um, and Arla decide to pay. Yeah, I understand that. Um, that's, that's quite helpful. Um, and what about uh, Morrison's? So, uh, under a similar structure to ASDA, I don't know if you're aware that there are, there are ten um, major multiple retailers as defined by the uh, Groceries Code Adjudicator. And as I understand it, four of those operate a uh, aligned pool where they have a cost of production model and six do not uh, like Asda, Morrison's are in the six. We don't have an aligned pool, so the price we set is set by our supplying dairy companies. In our case, those dairy companies are Arla, a farmer-owned cooperative, and the price would be the same price that uh, Asda farmers get, as Chris has just explained, and the, the remainder are for, from DC. Um, but in, the, the point really is that we negotiate a price with those companies for pasteurized, standardized, bottled milk delivered to our depots around the country and it's up to them to set the price, the, the farm gate price that the farmer receives. Um, so you're saying that, uh, you know, that in terms of the, sel the selection of the pool or the group from which this comes, that it would be Arla who would select who they provide you with milk from? Uh, uh, broadly, yes. Yes. Okay. Um, since uh, price volatility is a problem for dairy farmers, can the supermarkets say what their farm gate prices have been over the past few years? Well, I don't think we'd say what our farm gate price is. We could certainly say what our processors have provided. Right. Um, our relationship with Arla is going back nearly 10 years now. So right. we've been fairly consistent. I, I don't know if it would be any assistance, Chair, um, but I have got a handout which shows the Arla farm gate price and the retail price. Would that, that would be, be very of, helpful. That would yes, be, that be of any assistance. I have a few it certainly is, Apologies, yes. So if someone wishes to go this. Um, and it shows the way that we've tried to be consistent in supplying our customers with a very consistent price so that they can budget in these economically straightened times. At the same time, recognise that global trade has had an impact on, on the prices. I think I'll... Yeah, I've got to hang there you go. 
Uh, so you'll have to share or you need to get some photocopies um, and the way that the markets, the global markets have fluctuated in that time. Yeah, we've got some evidence of this, but that's a helpful addition. Uh, I have to say, um, you know, we've, we're in a position that uh, we're trying to get to the bottom of what is um, a complex matter and uh, every aid from uh, of this sort helps considerably because it clears up some of the questions about how you are pricing and what you're selling at is another matter that we'll come to in a minute. But um, <clears throat> are there any members who wanted to ask anything about the table we've just seen? Mike Russell. How often do you negotiate or renegotiate your arrangement with your uh, processor supplier? Um, the Asda Arla contract continues until the middle and end of next year. How often do you renegotiate it? That's you know, roughly every three, ten years. Roughly every three years. Every three years. Yeah. Okay. So when you say that it's the it's the processor's price rather than your price, if the processor were paying a price that was too high for what you wanted to do, then you would choose another processor. It's part of negotiation between business all the time. It's you know what their costs are, how costs change. You know, we had conversations about how we managed the situation last year when the milk price was up at 34 pence. I just want to push you a little on this because mm -hmm. you know, I think clarity is really important in this. Both of you have said you know, it is the, the processor's price, not the price you set. But the reality is, and I mean, I, I think this is inescapable, it's just a commercial reality. If the processor was setting a price that you didn't want to pay, you would, by the normal contractual process, choose another processor. Oh, sorry, Andrew. I'll, I'll come in on that. So, in terms of your first question on the period, so our, our previous deal, which just ended, uh, well, legally ends at the end of this month, but we have renegotiated and announced the result of that, was a five year deal with Arlo and Dairy Crest, and we've now about to commence a new three year deal with Arlo and Dairy Crest. So, three years sounds about industry norm. Um, so, in terms of answering your question, in terms of the renegotiation where we re awarded our milk contract to Arlo and, and DC, you know, we specifically negotiated on processing efficiency. Um, and one of the reasons Arlo is successful is it has a major investment in what we believe to be the world's best bottling facility in Buckinghamshire and, um, and also their distribution costs. And we compartmentalised milk price because it's, you know, being market driven, it is it, fairly common across the processes and was not a focus of our negotiations. So we, we awarded our liquid milk contract on the basis of say their processing and distribution costs almost entirely those are the key things for us yeah but those are costs you know so i mean the point I, I, this is not rocket science and i'm not trying to trip you up i'm just making a, a point which i think we need to understand at the very beginning you are companies clearly you're driven quite rightly by the need to make profit for your shareholders and your owners in those circumstances you are an influence on the price because if the price was too high you would choose somebody else to provide it to you. That is well, you could make capitalism. I that mean, argument, that however, I don't think it's borne out by the result of this tendering process because we actually increase the amount of liquid milk that we are buying from Arla. And if you look at the milk price league tables, they're quite near the top of that league table. So you know, that wasn't the deciding factor. On your logic, we'd have gone for the one near the bottom of the no, league table, I, and we I, didn't. I, I, so, sorry, with respect, that's not the case. I'm not pur pur purporting to give you a model uh, to run your own business. What I'm saying is... When you say this is a decision for the processors, it is actually part of the, let me put it this way, the mix of decisions by which you decide which processor gets the contract. That must be true. I mean, I think what's, what's worth saying is that there are a number of decisions. Is pricing relevant to that? Of course pricing is relevant to that, but it is not the decisive factor. And it's also worth recognising that the price that farmers are getting is to a large degree based on these global market fluctuations, which as an individual retailer, we'd have a fairly finite ability to impact upon. Um, there are massive market forces which are significantly more relevant on pricing. And as Andrew, I think, explained quite well, there are other fairly important factors on picking the right processor, and that comes back to, I'd say, manufacturing capacity, distribution, and so forth. It, is pricing relevant? Absolutely. Is it one of several factors? Absolutely. Okay, I'm, I'm not trying to do anything other than indicate you play a role in what the price is paid to farmers. I'm not saying... Anything other than that, but you have to accept you play a role in that. 
if we accept that, I mean, the, the, global, the milk markets are global in nature these days. I can demonstrate that. I know. I a I'm not disputing that. And, and just to qu qualify it further, the UK is, I think, 3% of global production, and Morrison's is 3% of, of UK production. So if there is an influence on the global milk price, by golly, it's a small one. No, I, I dispute that. I think you are a determinant in the price of milk because you have to be. You're buying it. You're part of the process. But... No matter, this seems too difficult to be accepted, but th that is, I think, indisputably the case. You are a player in this. We're kind of interested in the transparency for... Uh, oh, sorry, Dave Thompson's got a short... Uh, uh, thank you very much, convener. Just really a linked issue, just to follow on a little bit from that um, very interesting exchange uh, between Mr Russell and, and yourselves. Um, in... Recent times, uh, not that long ago, uh, the retailers were taking about 5% uh, uh, in relation to the milk. And uh, papers we saw last week indicated that your cut, your share, whatever you want to call it, had increased to 35%. Why do you think uh, that has happened? I, think the, I would... So in terms of profit margins, I would be astonished. We're certainly nowhere near that, that sort of figure you're coming up with. I think if you look at, at the public accounts that we do have, it indicates that the gross margin on, on kind of the dairy sector is something in the region of 20%. The net margin, which is significantly more relevant, is about 2% across both grocery and indeed across pretty much all the stuff in a supermarket. That's the margin we're working to now. Specifically on milk, it's worth noting that our kind of own brand uh, Scottish milk in stores is one that we've kept uh, four pints at 139 at the moment. We've actually not depressed that price significantly. We have on our, our tertiary brand, but not on the own brand Scottish milk. And that's partly because I think there is important to reflect that milk is a premium product. And while we face quite significant pressure from competitors and indeed from customers to reduce that price, it's... As, as you've addressed, if we start pushing the price of milk all the way straight through the floor, that's not necessarily great for the sector either. So it's, it's kind of quite a challenging balancing act for us. We have reduced milk price to a degree. That milk price reduction has come from our own profit margin. It certainly has had no impact whatsoever on the farm gate price. So retail and farm gate prices on this are decoupled at the moment and, and hopefully will remain so. Are you saying that um, the retailer's share hasn't increased in comparison to the producers in particular, uh, sorry, the, the uh, processors in particular uh, and the producers, is it not true that the, 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 the share of the profit, if you like, of producers and processors has gone down significantly and your share has actually increased in recent years? Well, if we talk about producers, obviously there's huge differences in the cost of production between individual farms and everything we talk about there is an average, an average of quite significant extremes. But just to reiterate Ewan's point, I mean, from our annual accounts, uh, with a bit of um, uh, mathematics, you can calculate our gross margin relatively easily on our goods. And I, I went around all of our teams yesterday in terms of um, liquid milk, cheese, dairy and butter, and had a discussion around the gross margins they're able to achieve. And I can categorically assure this committee they are slightly under the average gross margins for Morrison's retail as a group. So the question of us profiteering or making more, the trend is downwards. We're making less than we were. Stats which uh, Dave Thompson quoted from were, were from Dairy Co. from 1996 to January 2011. Uh, and it shows an increasing margin from a very low amount, as he said, to a much higher amount. Um, a marginally, very marginally less actually in price at the top end, but considerably less for the processor and also somewhat less for the producer. So is Dairy Co wrong? Well, they do sound like rather historic data, Chair. Um, I suspect, you know, given the fluctuations, one of the problems in all of this is you know, cheese is a matured product. And you know, it, cheese was made last year at 30 pence a litre. Uh, we now need to sell it. If we devalued it to the current liquid milk price or the current farm gate milk price, then the stocks would, would collapse in value. So we need to maintain uh, the retail, we need to maintain the price we pay for that product yeah. to enable those stocks to be cleared at the at the price that they were produced at. Thank you. Uh, just to remind you, I'm not a chair. I'm actually the convener, as the term we use in Scotland. Um, I, I, if you care to use that, it would be helpful. Um, 
Thanks for that answer, because we're digging into this with lots of different people, because, you know, we're trying to find out about the transparency of the whole matter. And, you know, farmers and customers each uh, have a particular issue here, because we know what customers are being offered by some supermarkets. Uh, and the milk supply chain, you know, we need to, to ensure that this transparency continues. Now, there was a voluntary code set up for... Uh, the producers and the processors. Do you think the supermarkets should be included in that because it's increased the transparency at that level? Do you think supermarkets should be part of that transparency uh, exercise in the voluntary code? It's built up some trust. Convener, we already have a code which we have to abide by, including an adjudicator. I understand that you'll be talking to... How does it, uh, well, how does it articulate with um, the code for you know producers and processors? Uh, if well, at there all, was, there was no connection. That was a distinctly a code between those two, two groups of people. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure how you'd be able to extend it up the supply chain. Well, that's what we're trying to explore. Yeah, I'm, so. I'm not aware. Well, so I haven't been. No proposals have been presented to me showing how that could operate. Um, have Morrison's of you? Uh, I think I agree with. Well, Chris said, I mean, the two codes are quite distinct and operate in different fields. And we don't have a, a direct relationship. Now, on beef, pork and lamb, uh, we buy direct from UK farmers for our own abattoirs. And because we buy from our own abattoirs, we are covered by that code in the relationship with the farmers because the, we as a supermarket right. have the direct interface. Whereas an indirect relationship, it's a different arrangement exists. Um, for so, dairy. Yeah. For dairy, yeah. indeed. Okay. Right, I thought we'd best ask you that. Um, thinking about resilience and efficiency, uh, Sarah Boyack is going to ask you a question. Yeah, um, one of the things that we've uh, been made aware of through representations from a couple of the supermarkets is that they, or supermarket chains, is that they work with farms and they've been attempting to support them to make them more resilient and more efficient, which is obviously a great thing from the farmer's perspective wondering what you think about those kind of initiatives. The, the kind of things they covered were um, things like help with vets, visits, um, access to professionally facilitated workshops and low-cost energy. Uh, yes, we have those types of groups too. We've titled them up as Pathfinder groups, um, which uh, focus on a variety of technical issues. Um, it's actually facilitated by independent consultants and the agenda is set by the farmers. It's not something that, that we organise, we, we support and deliver and uh, participate in. And we also have a next generation group for younger dairy farmers to address their issues as well. And, and similarly, I mean, I, I hold in my hand here and you can, I can distribute copies or you can download it free of charge to any dairy farmer from our website. It's a, an in-depth report into feeding the modern dairy herd and all the different avail uh, you know, feeding options available, supplements, etc., to dairy farmers. And this is sort of expert advice we have produced with our supply chain group working with Arla. But I reiterate, we make it available to, to any dairy farmer in the UK to download. And this is the, I think, over 10 reports of this nature we've produced, really helping to increase the level of expertise of those farmers who, you know, are at the, at the cutting edge, if I can put it that way, of their industry. So absolutely. I think the other big initiative that we'd like to mention of that nature is working um, first with First Milk and then um, under our new contract with DC, we'll be looking at mechanisms that will enable farmers to hedge. So uh, I, I have a, a supplement here, which I'm more than happy to supply after the meeting or whatever, explaining how the, the increasingly global nature of the dairy industry is only going to lead to more volatility in the future. So we've seen some unprecedented spikes uh, it may yet go down further. And my estimate, though I can't see the future, is when it comes back, it will come back strongly, quickly, and maybe even to unprecedented levels of, of milk price in the future. But what I'm describing is an increased volatility across all markets. And, and the only solution that we know that works in this sort of more volatile world market is a market-based solution based around hedging. Now, I'm not proposing that farmers can beat the markets by doing clever hedges. What I am proposing is that farmers... Uh, working through their processes and maybe even directly with us, can place hedges so that they can smooth out the, the volatility, so they can ret re achieve the long-term average price. 
Now, being an efficient processor, uh, sorry, a producer, doesn't really help you manage volatility. Um, what manages volatility for most small businesses is a strong balance sheet. Now, they don't all have that luxury. So if you can hedge and you get a more even uh, long-term average price, then one of the disincentives to invest in your dairy business is hopefully taken away. So we think there's a, a role for hedging in the future of the dairy industry at a producer level. And will that work for smaller farmers? It should work for, for any farmer, to be honest, because the more who participate, the more liquid those markets become in terms of, I don't mean liquid milk, I mean the more easily traded. And any farmer would be able to hedge in much the same way as you can hedge your power bill at the moment, you can, or your mortgage. You can choose to let it float, if that's the way you want to operate, or you can choose to lock in. And I foresee a future for the dairy industry where farmers can make that decision individually to let their milk price float or to lock in. Mm. And what about the low-carbon aspects? Um, we had a Scottish Retail Consortium presentation just last month, which was about all the supermarkets retailing end in terms of reducing your carbon footprint. What about your work with suppliers? Um, we, we've run the, I think it's the longest established uh, individual dairy farm carbon footprint data set. So it goes back uh, nearly seven years now. Um, and the relationship between productivity and carbon is quite clear the more efficient producers have the lower carbon footprint. The problem is some of the outliers, so people who have quite a high herd carbon footprint because they've got a very good herd and people want to buy pedigree stock from them will maintain larger numbers of heifers and bulls for sale. And that, unfortunately, sort of creates challenges in interpretation, but the trends are quite clear in terms of the overall relationships. Um, just to add on to Andrew's, we believe that actually farmers as part of a stronger farmer cooperative which is one of the reasons why we went with Arla, is their best um, hedge against the future. I'll just add, I think that's a perfectly legitimate point that Chris makes. There are two, I think, big options. One is binding together as a cooperative. The other is individually hedging. They're both legitimate ways of managing risk, and we need to encourage all the ways possible of managing risk. Um, on your point about carbon, uh, we've worked extensively with the Beef Improvement Group and the SRUC, uh, not least at our own farm at Dumfries House down in Ayrshire, um, on feed conversion efficiency. Now, most of this work has been advanced in the, in the beef field to date, but it would equally apply to the dairy field, and we need to get better at applying it to the dairy field. That, you know, different, um, different cattle genetics, different diets yield different feed conversion efficiency in terms of turning intake of feed into, in our studies case, beef, but also milk. Uh, and we're finding quite significant differences between different... Um, Group within similar populations of cattle of the same breed of the same age, we can get differences of up to 20% of the amount of feed required to produce the same amount of output. Now, that equates um, to almost exactly to carbon output too. So through better breeding, through better feeding, there is an ability to reduce the emissions from the bovine population of this country significantly. Uh, and, you know, it's an area where we need to concentrate our efforts is feed conversion efficiency across the national herd. I know you trade off... Um we saw something in the press about um, island farmers who are producing milk. How do you trade off the distance? Because I think your new big processing plant, you said it was in Aylesbury. Yeah, for how, how do you trade off the carbon impacts there versus the, the low carbon in terms of production on an island? So there is a trade-off, as you say. I mean, a more efficient plant um, is, is in itself more efficient because it bottles every bottle for a lower carbon footprint. However, you've got to offset the transport distance. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure we could get figures for that for you, but uh, I, can't, I don't have them to hand at the moment. But in terms of your uh, point about the highlands and islands, um, one of our major suppliers of cheese is uh, Lactalis McClellan. Uh, they're based in, in Stranra, in one of the, uh, Mr Ferguson's uh, constituency. Um, and the, the plant there, which is supplied by all of the southwest of Scotland, produces more than half of the cheese we sell in the whole of Morrison's UK-wide. So it is a huge uh, contributor to our, our cheese sales, a major category for us, and that's drawing from the, the area you refer to. So. Thanks. Can I explore, how do you actually measure the impact of the resilience and efficiency advice that you're giving farmers? And, and if you measure it, can you give us some idea of what that's showing? We see quite clear trends um, in terms of decline in carbon footprint. 
um, if I just use that as a proxy for, for efficiency, uh, as productivity has risen. Um, I think, it, to be fair, a lot of it was driven less, less by uh, our attention to carbon footprint, but the increased cost of artificial fertiliser, nitrogenous fertiliser. Um, but we've done a report, review report. If that would be helpful to the committee, I'll, uh, I'll send that, and it will show quite clearly where some of the results that we've been able to achieve. Okay. That's very helpful. Thank you. Um, turning to uh, promotion of Scottish produce, Mike Russell. Yes, you mentioned first milk in passing. I just want to, to, to push an issue that came from our evidence session last week and expand on it a little. Uh, quite clearly, first milk doesn't have any liquid milk contracts with either of you. Uh, <clears throat> but first milk does produce a variety of products, one of which is produced in my own constituency in Campbellton, Mull of Kintyre Cheddar. I think by common consent, first milk has been pretty poor at pushing that product, but the supermarket has been pretty poor at selling it as well. Now, the success of the dairy farm industry in my constituency is dependent upon the success of the Campbellton Creamery. Campbellton Creamery needs substantial additional uh, investment to make it truly competitive, but the Mullock Tire product is a premium product <coughs> that <coughs> can sell well and, when pushed in supermarkets, can be extremely attractive. But if you look at the cheese market, the butter market the yoghurt market, those markets are dominated in Scotland by products that are not made in Scotland. How can you play a more influential and more direct role in ensuring the health of the Scottish dairy industry? Because if you don't do that, if you aren't promoting products made in Scotland, then you are, not deliberately of course, but accidentally contributing to the decline of the Scottish dairy industry. So we have a dedicated Scottish um, sourcing team whose job it is to put Scottish products onto the shelves. Um, and that doesn't need to be an enormous nationwide quantity. We can do it by one product, by one store. The facility is there available to do that. Um, I would say it's one of the things we want to have happen. We need to have innovation. We need to have new products to meet the continually changing demands of the customer. Um, we've also tied in with Scotland Food and Drink, Scottish Food and Drink. Um, we have an academy, a supplier academy which we ran last in 2013. We had six new dairy suppliers on that, and their average sales to date have been increased by 300%. So you're right, when we get the right products in the right place for the right customers, then the sales are there. And that's one of the things we're committed to what doing. What is your best-selling cheese in Scotland? Cheddar? Ooh, it will be mild cheddar. Across the, across the country, it's mild cheddar. But we produce... But not manufactured in Scotland? Yeah, it's produced at uh, the Lockerbie site, the Isle of Lockerbie site, okay. uh, which not only produces that, but it also, in the same way as Andrew talks about, um, produces, uses 50 million litres of Scottish milk to produce cheddar to go into England. What's your best-selling butter? Um, well, you do have some very large brands. You know, Lurpak is an incredibly strong brand with a great customer reputation. But one of the fastest growing lines, for example, is the new Graham spreadable butter, which we're uh, which so we're stocking. you are cited on the need to increase that, those products? Uh, we will put the products in the line. At the end of the day, I, I was the milk buyer of one stage. I had some great products, which unfortunately nobody bought. It still rankles that bubblegum flavoured milk didn't win. Well, I don't think we're producing in Campbellton, but it's a thought. Uh, Andrew? Yes, is, uh, uh, we, well, you and I talk a little bit about the, the Scottish lines that we're, that we're introducing with our new deal with Graham's, but I, I mean, the premise of your question is we're not selling enough Scottish product. I mean, all of our cheddar, except a very small a bit of mild cheddar, which is made in, in Wales, um, all, of the, all of our cheddars um, come from our single biggest uh, cheese contract, which is like Talis McClelland, and I say, with the exception of the small volume that comes from Wales, all of our cheddars across the UK and a great deal of our other territorial cheeses are all made in Stranraer in Scotland from Scottish milk. So, you know, it's, it's Scotland has a, a way disproportionate uh, share of our cheese sales relative to its size in the UK. It's producing more than half of all the cheese we sell, despite having, what, 10% of the population, you'll know better, better than me. Um, so, and, and all, equally, under our Arla contract, all the liquid milk sold here is from Scottish dairies as well. In addition to that, we've just done a, a deal with, um, with Graham's, which Ewan can give a bit more flavour of. 
So, so absolutely to pick up on that. Firstly, on liquid milk, um, as part of our tendering process, obviously we renewed Avala and DairyQuest, but we took um, tenders from <coughs> nine main companies, one of which was Graham's. I know you heard from Robert Graham last week. And if you've looked at the small print, you'll see in today's Scotsman and Herald that we've announced that Graham's will be supplying their own brand milk and butter throughout our Scottish estate. They'll be supplying one of their own brand milks throughout our entire UK estate, about 500 stores or so. So that's a, a recognition that when a Scottish company puts a really good proposition together, where they've got the right support mechanisms in place and the right branding and demand for the product, that absolutely we can see a demand for it. And, and I think Mr Russell's absolutely right. I would also like to reassure him that Mull of Kintyre cheddar is sold in Morrison stores. I checked it at our South Gile store yesterday afternoon, to be certain. Um, so we stock that throughout it. We also stock Campbelltown in our deli section as well, uh, alongside Loch Ryan cheese, Loch Cabby and uh, Orkney cheddars as well as the kind of specialist Scottish lines. In terms of butter, the majority of our, our Scottish stores have Rowan Glen butter. They also take the Rowan Glen um, yoghurt as well, which is Newton Stewart, I believe, that's manufactured. And as Andrew's explained, our, our, most of our cheddar um, throughout the UK comes from Scotland. In Scotland specifically, we brand our mild and mature cheddar as Scottish mild and Scottish mature cheddar because we recognise in Scotland that there is a, a demand and recognition of that product. That doesn't yet exist beyond Scotland in a way that it does in other lines. Obviously, we see Scottish beef. We are, and this, uh, Morrison's Isle looks like Murrayfield on a busy day with the amount of salt tiles we put on our beef section. We don't see the same demand and desire in, in those areas yet. That's, again, something that the industry probably needs to look at. And I know that James Withers spoke quite effectively about that last week to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Graham Day, a supplementary, first of all. Now, yes, yeah, if I may convene on. Just in the interest of balance, I mean, we're exploring with you gentlemen today what you do to promote Scottish dairy products. Are there any barriers that you encounter to successfully or better promoting Scottish dairy products? And please feel free to be candid with us. <laughs> well, I think... Um and James has already been mentioned, I think being able to plug into innovation, uh, and again, I'm, I'm a, applying broad brush strokes here, but because of the level of self-sufficiency which the UK was left with um, in the introduction of quotas through the European Union, we never had quite the same um, impetus that other major dairy exporting countries have had to do th different things with milk. And I think that's one of the things where we see a crying need. You know, what else can we add value to milk by? Uh, and, and I think we do need to be slightly bold, and it can't just be around region and, and origin, which I get is important, but also it, that only goes so far. Ultimately, we didn't, um, if you can remember the um, uh, biohealth drinks which came out, we really weren't part of that um, when that came around within the British and Scottish and UK industry. And I think we just need to see uh, a greater development push um, and strategic vision about doing that. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. I mean, innovation in processing for some new and growing sectors, um, children's yogurts, dairy-based desserts, etc. most of that innovation is coming from overseas companies, often with overseas um, produced product. It would be great for the UK industry uh, to have the confidence to invest in and innovate in that way. Now, confidence is difficult when we talk about the volatility levels that we've had. I mean, you see the Irish have a very ambitious strategy. You see the NFU put forward an ambitious strategy for growing the dairy production in the UK, particularly in England, and they, they've had it thrown back in their face, which I feel very sorry for them, as though, as though the small increase in UK production that they advocated was, was somehow responsible for the price collapse we've seen. It's just not. It's a global phenomenon. Prices have collapsed across the world. It's nothing to do with the, the NFU encouraging greater production. So we do need confidence. We need a, a national strategy uh, for dairy, um, and, and we need that investment. But how on earth do you do that when we've had such a seesaw in prices? So that's the big inhibitor. Okay, thank you. And if I may move on to my, my question, uh, Convener. Um, do you gentlemen think that promotional initiatives such as Year of Food and Drink work? Do you buy into these sort of promotional initiatives? Uh, and if so, what will you specifically be doing in 2015 as part of Year of Food and Drink, and where might, say, Scottish cheese fit within that? In, in terms of Years of Food and Drink, we've certainly always are in conversation with the Scottish Government on this. We have a very good relationship with the Food and Drink team. Of specific areas, we tend to look at the, the product lines and things that we're particularly committed to. We've got a good area on. I know that certainly, as we've kind of mentioned once or twice, red meat, beef and lamb, because we work directly with farmers, we manufacture in Scotland, that's an area that we're quite able to get behind. But that's 
it had to be absolutely straightforward. It aligns with our interests. We're very happy to promote Scotland and promote Scottish products when they're strong. But other areas which are, are less relevant are probably going to be less of a focus in terms of our, our approach. It's also, certainly from our perspective, from Morrison's, we tend to look on our, our kind of scale approach to most issues as UK-wide. That's the, the market we work in. So that's why when we talk about sort of milk and cheese, we'll say we're 100% British, we're 80% British on cheese, 100% British on liquid milk, because that's the, the scale level we're working in. And we're happy to work on a Scottish level, but sometimes it's a case of you know, reconciling a, a quite a central team in Yorkshire with you know, what exactly Scotland wants to do. That's certainly an area we're looking at and we're looking to do more in. Uh, well, generic advertising is always one of those interesting topics. I think it generally has a good record. It raises awareness. Um, we're happy to support it. Um, we're 100% Scottish cheese, 100% Scottish milk, and Scottish cheese cream. So anything which re drives the customer's appreciation for the quality of those products and hence improves sales will be something that we are interested in supporting. And if I may, what sort of feed-in do you have to initiatives such as these? Do you have any sort of input to it at all? Well, to be fair, it's, it's food and drinks um, yeah. strategy, yeah. so um, it, we have close relations with them um, and hope that our views are taken account of, but ultimately, if you want to challenge their strategy, I suggest you get Mr Withers back. No, I, I'm not looking to, to suggest that. The point I'm trying to make is, d does the, the retail uh, sector have any input into suggesting initiatives at any stage, and, and would you welcome such an opportunity? So uh, from, our, from our perspective and our relationships, both with the, the government's food and drink team, and, and it's less relevant for us, we're not members of Scotland Food and Drink at the moment, although I, I believe others are. But we certainly have, a, as I say, opportunities on a regular basis to meet with people from the food and drink team. Okay. We meet uh, at least annually, if not more often, with Mr Lockhead, to be honest, and he's always you know, very robust on talking about Scotland and what's there, and, and really keen to listen to our views to help promote Scottish produce. And I think that that's a, a very good relationship we have there. Uh, we're very okay. fortunate with that, I would say. And Jim Hume. Yeah, and good morning, everybody. Just a couple of lines uh, regarding more the dairy products rather than the milk itself, cheeses and, uh, and yogurts. Just wondering um, for yourselves as supermarkets, how you determine which pro uh, products get prominent sh shelf space? What is the criteria for that? In principle, it's the products which people want to buy. We can't afford to have any passengers on the shelves. Um, and the chiller area in a, in a retail store is one of the busiest, highest sales densities that we have. So every product um, which is on there is having to justify its sales at a very high level. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, those sorts of practices, that sort of um, commercial pressure, if you like, is common across the retail sector. So my, my answer wouldn't differ from Chris's answer there. Okay. Uh, therefore, just following up on that, uh, we've heard that some... Supermarkets request payment for prominent shelf space and uh, that even payments to actually tender uh, even before they know they've got the contracts. That's obviously very difficult or would be very difficult for small producers. Is this something either of yourselves as supermarkets do or have done? So there's no listing fees at all for the Scottish products coming in on the, through the regional team. So the small, medium-sized enterprises who are supplying those um, products, they do not have listing fees. Is this, been a, is this perhaps evidence from the past and from yourselves? Or? No, don't, we've never charged listing fees for those products. Never charged listing fees. Uh, and for, the, for those products. Okay, for, the, for those products. And uh, right to tender, is, is, which is maybe something slightly different? Uh, no. No. So, it, it, you know, taking a step back, um, two-thirds of the cheese we sell is under our own brand. Okay, so that's uh, Morrison's packaging, as I said, majority made in Scotland. Um, so one third is branded, and it depends on those brands. There are big, robust brands who deliberately invest in that brand, so it has high consumer recognition, and they, ha they bring with them, when they ask us to list them, a package of support to help us sell that product, to help get its name more widely recognised. Mm -hmm. Now, if we're talking about the very small speciality cheeses, of which some of the, the island products you've mentioned, that wouldn't apply to those very small brands where they're part of a, a regional or national offering from relatively small companies. But there's a company's get bigger, they deliberately want to invest in their brand and they, they do a, a range of things to, to invest in that brand, to help us sell it for them, to establish, to, to increase consumer recognition of that brand. Uh, and part of that range would be actually paying to have shelf space and paying to have, or, and or have 
I, 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 don't, I don't know I can get you a categorical answer on that. Um, it's certainly at the smaller end of the SMEs that Chris refers to, it wouldn't apply for the bigger brands. I don't know the detail, but I can get it for you. Okay, uh, that would be helpful if you could, thanks. <coughs> A supplementary from Graham Day. Yes, uh, thank you. Just to help inform our, uh, this process, I'm wondering if, if there have been any sort of changing pattern of demand over the last three, four years with these difficult economic times that we're in. Are you seeing your customers move into the cheaper type of cheeses or, or is the, the more niche market holding up? Certainly when the cheddars were hitting £7 a kilo, there was price resistance. It was very subtle, because actually what, what we detected was an increase in the spreadable cheeses, you know, the little pots. Um, the, the sales of those rose. And when we sort of dig slightly deeper into it, it's because the customer recognised there'd be no waste. You know, that bit of hard cling wrap cheese at the back of the fridge wouldn't be encountered because they can scrape everything out. Um, the market moves in very, you know, say, very clever, defined ways. And in this instance, the customers have moved to those products before we did, and we then had to, or then we responded by increasing the range of those products. Okay. It's certainly worth acknowledging, though, in a broader sense that we've seen, you know, price sensitivity being incredibly important to customers in recent years, and, and certainly the kind of way the grocery market has changed is, is absolutely astonishing. The sort of change, pace of change is phenomenal, and, and certainly up our response has been to respond by, by lowering prices across the board. We think that's the right approach. Um, we're seeing that, you know, it's become very, very competitive on retail prices amongst retailers, and, and as also very competitive on price as well. So it's, there is a wider story there about people looking around, people being more sensitive, looking perhaps at shopping at different grocers, trying to find the right approach. So I would be, I don't have a specific data set, I'd be very surprised if the dairy sector was immune to that, um, with all caveats about premium products. Okay. The, the only thing I'd add is, not really related necessarily to price and the, the economic environment, but they've seen a huge growth in, as Chris said, spreadable cheese products, which often have uh, less specific origin. Uh, if I can put it that way, uh, some of the branded products, and also salad uh, cheeses, uh, are very fashionable, um, and are often imported, the fetters, etc. Um, so um, there may be uh, UK-type uh, salad cheeses that could be developed, uh, and that is a niche that is probably underexploited at the moment, certainly a growth area. Okay, thank you. Just very, very quickly, Gavina, it's probably worth noting that Scotland trades in dairy products relative to other parts of the UK. Okay. okay, thank you. And um, <coughs> so you're finished, Jim. Yep. Yes, sir. Right. Um, Looping on to the grocery code adjudicator, Angus MacDonald. Yes, thanks, uh, Convener. Uh, good morning, uh, gentlemen. The um, <coughs> grocery code, code adjudicator has already been mentioned this morning, uh, albeit briefly. Um, now, the panel will be aware that uh, the EFRA <coughs> committee at Westminster uh, published recommended changes to the remit of the GCA. Um, as recently as the 20th of January, uh, including uh, that the government should consider how the remit can be extended to incorporate suppliers throughout the supply chain. Uh, also, um, that the GCA should be able to accept complaints from indirect as well as direct <coughs> suppliers, and that the adjudicator should have the power to launch uh, proactive investigations as well as to respond to complaints. And also, I believe the issue of uh, um, issuing fines has, has also been uh, suggested. Um, has the establishment of the Groceries Code Adjudicator had any impact on your operations uh, since uh, the post was created in uh, June 2013? And if there is to be a change to the remit uh, of the GCA, as uh, seems likely, uh, how would that affect your operation and how you source dairy products, including liquid milk? So, um, in terms of change of operation, then everybody who is, comes under its remit has to be trained every year, records kept and reported upon. Um, and we now have chief compliance officers and similarly other, other retailers who are covered under the code do. So, there's a complete structure of, uh, of how that is complied with, the code is complied with. Um, I have to confess, I, I struggle. I don't know how people are going to be... I know people have suggested its remit is extended. I'm not quite sure how that would operate. Um, given the fragmented nature of the industry, I think Andrew's already presented the numbers, even as does milk, is less than 5% of total Scottish milk production. Um, it doesn't cover, the, the code doesn't cover um, caterers, public procurement, may I say, wouldn't come under it. So there are still lots of other players in the milk market um, who would come under its remits, and I'm not quite sure how any extension 
would be able to thoroughly operate. And the costs may yet be quite large because they are borne by those who are covered by the code. Chris has made a lot of valid points. So we, we too have a uh, specific, um, I've got the title, but personally looks after our relationship with the code and ensures internal compliance. And it, it's not me. And, and, and you're welcome, welcome to speak to him, I'm sure. Um, but I think often people stretch out for the, the, the groceries code adjudicator as a way of looking for a solution to what we all see is a, is a, is a, is a, is a big problem in the dairy industry right now. They're scratching around for what we can do as stakeholders, as politicians. Um, I've already said that really my belief is that to have stronger cooperatives, yes, and also abilities for farmers to hedge forward, to protect themselves from volatility is the right way forward. If the, the grocery code adjudicator's role is strengthened in some way, how far up the chain do they go? And are you, are you seriously suggesting they interfere in the, the price negotiations? Maybe the structure of the contract at some point, but the price negotiation is, is, a, is a private area and nobody can regulate that to the, to the extent that I think people want. So I'm in favour of market-based solutions to remove volatility. I can't see um, the best will in the world, the adjudicator stretching into its tentacles into all those areas where you, you, you think it might be able to produce a solution. I don't think it can. OK, thanks. We'll, we'll obviously have the opportunity to explore that further with the adjudicator uh, tomorrow. So, thank you. Um, moving on to wider uh, fields, um, Claudia Bibish. Right, thank you, Convener. Good morning. Um, I'd like to uh, turn our minds towards um, the interventions that um, you would like to see or particular action um, taken by Scottish or UK government or at the EU level. Um, to address current issues in the dairy sector. Uh, there's obviously been um, discussion about the intervention price for, for milk, and I, we're all aware um, that that's a complex issue in, in relation to what that price actually relates to. Um, but any comments on that would be valued by the committee. And also any, anything about um, any planning problems that um, you, you perceive as as um, the industry at any level facing for investment in processing, promoting export opportunities or whatever. So at, at any level of government, really. Let's not miss out local authority either. <laughs> One aspect, if I may, um, and Andrew's already quite rightly raised the issue of, of volatility. And fully enough, the, I'm sure if the committee is aware, but the global dairy trade auction last night jumped by 9% and whole milk powder jumped by nearly 20%. So I think as government intervention has been withdrawn and we all hope that the Commission is right and we have a soft landing in the milk market this year when quotas are abolished, I suspect that that might not be the case and that we are facing into increased volatility. I think there are things which can be done at the taxation level. I'm certainly inclined to support those that suggest that income is smoothed over a longer period. Um, it's very difficult for farmers to manage their tax affairs on a, on a two-year smoothing, and maybe a five-year smoothing would enable them to be able to uh, adapt to the changes and fluctuations in the marketplace. So it's, it's a very broad question. Um, I think the point about MH, HMRC tax smoothing is a very good one. Um, come back to hedging, that would also help in that regard. The EU intervention level, as I understand it, still theoretically exists, but not till we get down to something like 17p. Yeah. Uh, so approximately, don't quote me. Um, That's my understanding as well. Yeah, so, you know, in, in the... I mean, thank God we're not there yet, and I, I really hope we never get to those sort of levels. So, um, you know, the era of, of massive um, EU-level intervention in the dairy markets, you know, it feels like it's coming to a close. The EU simply can't afford that, those sorts of measures anymore. So I reiterate, we need to look at market-based mechanisms for the management of risk. Um, I'll think more on your question, and, and think if, if I can think of anything else further to contribute, we will do in bit evidence. As a very small final point on planning and local authorities, we don't obviously speak specifically about the challenges that dairy producers face, but I, I can assure you we find the planning regime to be astonishingly complex to work with at times um, from a, a wider retail perspective. Is that particularly related to Scottish local authorities or to local authorities <laughs> in general? I won't comment on that. <laughs> well, that's all right, you know, because we might well have the same view. <laughs> Um, thank you very much, gentlemen. That's been most helpful to us. Uh, you um, were amongst the first to volunteer to come along here uh, and uh, enlighten us about your view on these things uh, as we investigate this further. 
uh, I've no doubt we may come back and ask you some other questions. But if you're open to that, we'd be pleased. And of course, you've offered to give us bits and pieces of extra detail just now that have arisen during the previous uh, session. So thank you very much, uh, witnesses. Um, we're going to suspend now for five minutes before our second panel comes in. Thank you.
Start again just now. So uh, we hear our second panel as part of our consideration of the dairy industry this morning, and uh, introduce uh, themselves. Uh, frequent visitors here. Uh, welcome to Richard Lockhead, Cabinet Secretary for Rural Affairs, Food and Environment, and um, Frank Strang, Deputy Director, Food, Drink and Rural Communities Division of the Scottish Government. Did you want to say something, first of all, or are you just happy for us to ask you some questions? Is that an invitation, convener? I'm delighted to be here. <laughs> I'm happy to say a few words uh, at the beginning. I, I would like to perhaps just set the scene slightly, so thank yeah, you for I the opportunity. Uh, and firstly, allow me as Cabinet Secretary to congratulate the, part, the, the, the committee on instigating this inquiry uh, into milk prices in the dairy sector. Uh, we all know it's a sector that's facing some challenges at the moment, and it's good to, to air some of those issues uh, and, and challenges uh, at this time. Global production has been high due to both investment and good weather, and we know that demand from importers has also been particularly weak and much weaker than expected, particularly in certain markets such as China. So many of the issues facing the dairy sector in Scotland and beyond at the moment are clearly influenced by those global sectors. However, in Scotland I've spent a lot of effort, uh, and the government spent a lot of resources in the last couple of years putting together our Ambition 2025 proposals, which came out of our dairy review that we carried out uh, a year or two ago. So whilst I recognise there are some domestic issues that certainly you are looking at as a committee, quite rightly, and there are global issues that perhaps we have limited influence over, but we certainly have to be aware of, I think it's important that the Scottish Government says on the record that we feel very optimistic about the long-term future of the dairy sector in Scotland. And it's really important whilst we address some of those short-term and medium-term issues, which are very serious issues, and we're taking action to help address those, that we don't take our eye off the ball in terms of our current strategy to realise the long-term benefits that are there for Scotland's economy and the dairy sector in this country. So it's a, I guess it's a twin-prong approach at the moment, trying to help address some of those short-term challenges, but not being distracted from our longer-term strategy because this is a sector which is highly skilled, makes fantastic products, and has a, a big future. <clears throat> I am, at the moment, working on a number of measures, and perhaps just touching upon a couple of those. It is my intention to publish a plan in the foreseeable future. I had thought about doing it before this uh, committee appearance. However, given that we have a parliamentary inquiry into milk prices in the dairy sector, I thought perhaps, given I want to understand what you feel perhaps are some of the solutions for moving forward. And given that there's a number of proposals we're still working on at government level, that I'll just wait a few more days before we publish that plan. But I'm happy to discuss individual proposals that are within that today. And to give you some quick examples, some of the exciting initiatives in the pipeline include the development of a Scottish dairy brand, which will be launched at the Anuga Food Fair in October. Uh, that, I think, is going to be an exciting development for the dairy sector in Scotland. We're also, at the moment, taking some active steps to encourage investment in new processing capacity, enhancing the volume and diversity of what Scotland's got to offer in the dairy sector. We're also using a, 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 the range of levers we do have available to spread best practice in the dairy farming community. Uh, and finally, we are looking at tailored, well-coordinated support to first milk in particular, to allow it to make the necessary adjustments to, to thrive in the more short to medium term uh, as well. That's just some, some examples of some of the issues we're working on at the moment. I will bring all of them and others together and also reflect on what your committee says and publish a plan in the next couple of weeks, uh, which will hopefully communicate exactly what's happening to the wider dairy community uh, in the country. Thank you, uh, Cabinet Secretary. We, we've covered to some extent the global factors which you mentioned at the beginning of your remarks and the influence of global factors on the market. But we can see, for example, from uh, supermarket evidence that there's a very small impact that even large supermarkets in the UK have on the overall uh, price and fluctuations that uh, occur. So when we're talking about that, focusing on Scotland, what kinds of influences does this world market have on the product that we can make in our small way? 
Well, that question very much gets to the heart of where I think the future dairy strategy should be heading in Scotland. Because it's certainly the case that we clearly are not immune to global factors, as I outlined in my opening remarks. I know that you've heard from many witnesses and are, are, are chewing over. The long-term projected growth is substantial across the world for dairy produce. So that means the commodity prices will no doubt rise in the years ahead. However, commodity prices are volatile, as we're experiencing just now. And because our dairy production in this country is exposed to commodity prices, therefore it has an impact on the prices that farmers receive for their produce. So clearly, my view in terms of securing a, a better future for dairy in this country is to be more sheltered from the volatility of global commodity prices, but also at the same time take advantage of the fact that demand for dairy produce is expected to substantially grow across the world, which of course brings major export opportunities for Scotland. <clears throat> at the moment, clearly, our reliance on liquid milk and the fact that much of our produce goes into commodity markets because it's not capturing added value or niche markets brings that impact of the global prices on Scottish producers. So the dairy strategy we have in Scotland with the Ambition 2025 is clearly to add value to the primary product and to capture new markets. And these new markets tend to be more valuable than some of our domestic liquid milk markets. So we shouldn't have all our eggs in one basket, forgive the pun. We have to not just have liquid milk, we have to add value to the primary product and capture some high value markets and that will help shelter us in this country from some of these global factors. It's interesting, we've got comparative figures uh, compiled by Dairy UK from DEFRA, Scottish Government, Welsh and Northern Irish governments, which show farm business income for dairy product, uh, products from uh, 2006 to 2013. Uh, and in Scotland, the figures tend to be lower than those for England. Indeed, uh, there's been a rise, you could say, in England that's been greater than the rise there's been in Scotland. There's fluctuations we can see in it, but there seems to be a particular crisis at the moment in the last couple of years for Scotland. Well, I guess that <clears throat> just reiterates some of the points I was just making, perhaps my, my previous answer to you, which is that Scotland's perhaps too exposed to the commodity markets. And, you know, we do have plants in this country which are sending a proportion of its produce to premium markets, but far too much of its output to the commodity markets. And, and therefore, if that's more of the case in Scotland than it is in the rest of the UK, then clearly that's going to be reflected in these statistics. Fine. I, I, I think it's well worth having some of these on the record because it, it, it kind of points up the problems that we're facing particularly. Um, Jim Hume wants to ask a question now. It's going right. to be near yeah, thank you, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary. You, you mentioned that you know, there was a weak demand from China, but uh, there is still growth in the China market. Uh, I believe there's figures that we heard last week was uh, there's still a 2% growth, albeit that uh, a little less than the 10% growth when it was higher, but growth nonetheless. And if you look to New Zealand, there's been a, a tremendous growth in, in the dairy industry there. Uh, all mainly uh, focused at Southeast Asia, uh, including China. Now, obviously, New Zealand's uh, quite a small place, uh, quite some distance from 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 China. Uh, and I think the last uh, last notes that I saw, it, it's worth about eight billion pounds, or uh, sixteen thousand, si sorry, sixteen uh, billion New Zealand dollars. The dairy industry uh, to New Zealand. So I wonder, if, with that in mind, um, what do you think the opportunities are here? What do we need to change regarding uh, dairy farming uh, so that we can, you know, perhaps um, meet that and, uh, and well, become more resilient to the dairy industry? Again, in terms of the dairy review we carried out a couple of years ago, and now we have the Dairy Growth Board, which is chaired by Paul Grant of Mackay's Jams. And that was because we wanted him to transfer his experience and expertise from his very successful company that's made massive inroads into export markets to the dairy sector. 
and clearly other countries are ahead of the game in that regard, and you've mentioned quite rightly New Zealand. Now, New Zealand is not Scotland. It has mm -hmm. devoted a huge focus to dairy in the last few years and really swung its production patterns round from other sectors to dairy and focused on the Chinese market. Uh, and clearly that appears to be paying dividends for New Zealand. So it's focused very much on export markets and the growing export markets in terms of the Chinese. <coughs> Scotland is <coughs> needing to catch up. Mm -hmm. And again, we, I, I believe, are beginning to put into place the building blocks to try and get similar success for Scotland. So, you know, Paul Grant in particular, I don't know if he's giving evidence to the committee. If not, it would have been worthwhile hearing from Paul Grant. He's steeped in dairy issues just now, which for a for a, a jam man, he's you know suddenly becoming an expert in dairy. Uh, so he is looking at all these opportunities for Scotland to really make its mark in international markets for dairy exports. Okay. Uh, yeah, sorry. You I just to just add to that. I mean, I think <coughs> the one thing to remember is dairy is part of a successful Scotland food and drink generally sector and with a, with a great reputation. And, and I'm thinking of 11 months ago, we launched an export plan for food and drink for Scotland. And we've got newly appointed experts in market in Japan, in Canada and other um, priority markets around the world. So they will be as a priority looking at dairy. Um, we have those people in place. And the other thing to say is the other important strand is showcasing to overseas buyers what we are able to do. So the, the kind Secretary alluded to a Scottish brand to be launched in October in Anuga. That will be preceded by a showcasing Scotland event where we get overseas buyers to come here. And again, we shall be prioritising dairy in the things that we do. Okay. Uh, Alec Ferguson. Uh, thank you very much, convener. I wonder, I, I just, the, the, the subject of New Zealand came up, and I just wonder if the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that we're not entirely comparing like with like if we compare the Scottish dairy industry with New Zealand. And I partly think that, I mean, you, you, we will never catch up with New Zealand, if I don't like that phrase particularly, but given the fact that New Zealand has a climate that, that means they don't have to house their dairy cows for six months of the year, uh, many of them aren't housed at all, um, you know, on a cost of production basis alone, we're, we're not doing ourselves any favours in making that comparison. I'm sure there are lessons to be learnt from the New Zealand dairy sector, but I wonder if you'd agree with me that we don't just want to be trying to copy everything that's done in New Zealand because the factors uh, of, of milk production are very different. I, I, I do agree with uh, Alec Ferguson, I do agree with you, and I was careful to say Scotland is not New Zealand when I was uh, referring to Jim Hume's question, and clearly there are upsides and downsides to all these strategies, and I don't think the picture in New Zealand is all rosy, uh, and there are environmental considerations uh, to be taken into account with the the intense focus in one sector in New Zealand at the moment, in particular, some people tell me. So I think we have to have a balanced approach. And Scotland's not New Zealand, so we're, we're starting from a completely different place and our industry is different. I fully accept that. Um, Robert Graham said to us that, uh, you know, whilst talking about exports is interesting, we have to win, as in football, the home game first. Uh, and with that in view, uh, Mike Russell wants to talk about... Uh, some matters to do with first milk that are important here. Um, Cabinet Secretary, I was interested in what you said about the action plan. You, you presaged that in the meeting we had with, you had with Kintyre and uh, Butte Farmers two weeks ago. Um, in terms of the action plan, I think my own constituents will be looking for two things. One is a series of actions that will guarantee the future of the creamery in Campbellton, and I'll come on to that in a moment. But the second one is a, a, a medium-term plan, medium to long-term plan, that will give the producers a reason for staying in the business. Um, and I think all of the actions will be judged by those two criteria within my own constituency, things that will give a continuity to activity and also ensure that there's a continuity to what they're trying to do. Um, I wonder if the Scottish Government has thought any further about what it can do to secure the dairy industry in the remoter parts of Scotland, and particularly in Kintyre and in Butte and in Arran, uh, which must be seen as the most marginal parts of the Scottish dairy industry, and therefore the most vulnerable to the price fluctuations that are taking place. I'm sure uh, Mr Russell will welcome the fact that when I was at the European Council the week before last, I ensured that the UK raised the dairy issue 
uh, during the Council of Ministers debate on the Russian food import ban. And one issue I managed to get raised at Council was the specific impact that the current issues are having on island communities in Scotland, who so were actually mentioned at the Council at Scotland's request. And in terms of Campbellton and the Moth Cantire, uh, I believe that Campbellton can have a really bright future. I think it's got a lot going for it. And that's why the Scottish Government is keen to work with First Milk on the future of the Campbellton Creamery. Uh, as the committee will be aware, I've been involved in this issue for several years, working with the company, and we have made grants available that can be called down for uh, modernising and adapting the plant for the future. And we continue to make those offers uh, to the company, and, and there's some good conversations taking place at the moment between First Milk and Scottish Government over the, the future of Campbellton and, and the upgrade that's required there. But it's quite correct to say there are, of course, additional challenges for uh, the dairy sector on our islands. And <clears throat> I think there's one or two answers to your question. Firstly, there's the fact that we have a fantastic marketing opportunity for island and more rural communities, whether it's Amalfi Kintyre or whether it's Butte. And that can help us target niche markets and, for instance, Malk and Tire Cheddar is a top quality premium product and we can use the image and the reputation of rural Scotland and our island communities uh, to help sell that into overseas markets. And I think that's a big opportunity. And I'm told that you can get three times the return for a packet of cheese being sold overseas than what you can get in our supermarkets here in this country. Three times. Therefore, there's a fantastic opportunity for Campbellton to uh, find niche markets overseas. In terms of day-to-day -day support from the government, well, we do take into account the additional pressures facing our more rural and island communities in terms of primary production. That's reflected in some of our support mechanisms through the, the Common Agricultural Policy, particularly LFAS, uh, and our wider rural development programme clearly has some schemes within there to, to help our island and more rural communities. Uh, I am aware there are some issues that Michael Russell has raised in relation to transport costs and other costs. I am feeding them into the current review of ferry fares that the government is carrying out. So whilst I'm not in a position to see where that will go, I think it's important that's part of that debate moving forward. And again, you know, I, open, I remain open to any other ideas the committee may have. Can I, can I just press you on some of those points, because I think they are important. I mean, you're absolutely right about the premium on Mull of Kintyre Cheddar, uh, £5,000 a tonne for Mull of Kintyre Cheddar, as opposed to something around um, uh, 3000 uh, perhaps even less, a tonne uh, for what might be called bog-standard cheddar. But the figures are pretty stark in terms of the quantity. Last year, only 240 tonnes of Mull of Kintyre Cheddar were exported. And that's out of a production of the creamery of 3,200 tonnes. So that's less than 10%, well under 10%, goes into that premium product. Another 1,200 tonnes of Mullen Kintyre cheddar may have been produced, but the creamery lost a substantial sum of money. Now, there appear to be eight areas in which action could be taken, some of which would help uh, the wider first milk community and some of which would work, help rural Scotland in particular. Very briefly, if I might, just to touch very briefly on these because they're yep. important. The first one is the investment in the creamery. You indicate that you know, discussions are continuing. I know that first milk regarded as crucial that those discussions come to a satisfactory conclusion so that uh, they have started on the investment and they can continue with it. Secondly, Frank mentioned the in-market export resource. There is a need for a dedicated in-market export resource for dairy products, particularly in North America, even for a short period of time. SDI has been very helpful, but there's need for more. There is need for a very big marketing push, and I'm very pleased to hear about the Scottish, a Scottish brand. That needs to tie together brands such as Mullen Kintyre and others and not stand in their place. Keeping producers in the market is absolutely essential. And if, you know, it, particularly in Butte, as we heard last week, where any producer who leaves the market would increase the transport costs for others. So anything can be done in transportation and other costs with urgency to keep the producers in the market. Examination, there was a meeting in Mull of Kintyre two weeks ago about possible long-term solutions. I think First Milk will be open to 
partnership arrangements, and of course the Orkney solution is an interesting one in terms of the participation of local authority or HIE in upgrading uh, the premises and perhaps operating them in a different way. There are legacy pension liabilities that First Milk carries, which it, it carries on from a, the former Milk Marketing Board. Uh, is, they're not massive, but they might be the opportunity for a cash injection. The company of those could be taken elsewhere. There are issues about the size of First Milk and whether it needs to work more, accurate, more, more constructively with other and larger producers. And finally, you will be familiar with the Irish investment in research and development in the last uh, 10 days, where well, there's been a very substantial investment in research and development in the dairy industry. It, looking around the Scottish dairy industry, with the exception of the work that SRUC has done, there doesn't seem to be any substantial research and development or new product development. Uh, we heard about that this morning from the retail sector, that all the innovation in product uh, in the dairy sector is coming from outside, and outside the UK, actually. Those are all possible areas where there could be some action taken, and I just wonder if you will consider those as part of some of the issues for the dairy plan? Well, there's a number of useful points made there, and I'm aware of some of them, but not all of them, so we'll take uh, those issues away in relation to First Milk's future. Some may be appropriate for Scottish Government intervention, some may not be quite as appropriate for Scottish Government intervention, so clearly we'd have to uh, consider each one and its merits. A couple of quick comments. Uh, firstly, I think you've highlighted the opportunity for the Campbellton Creamery in particular to capture more export markets and we have made an offer to First Milk to lend advice and expertise in order to access new markets overseas. I've already spoken to the Chief Executive of Scottish Development International uh, about giving an extra focus in international markets to dairy products and we also have to be conscious, of course, that we have a fantastic company which is innovative, ambitious, and exactly what we want to see in Scotland in the form of Graham's. Mm. And they are making a success <coughs> of the domestic market. Mm. So ironically, some companies may take the view that you have to export to be successful, whereas Graham's are showing you can be very successful in the domestic market. So we have to do both. And we have examples of how both can be successful. So clearly for any dairy company to be really successful, they have to make a success of the home market, but also capture new export markets, I would suggest. So I think there's lots of opportunities for First Milk there. Uh, and in some of the issues you've mentioned, we're already pursuing, I've given you a couple of examples. I'd also say the Dairy Growth Board would be the ideal vehicle for taking forward one or two of your ideas, particularly the research and development aspect, and for, for them to look into that. That's partly their role, because research and development will be key to the growth of the dairy sector in Scotland in the years ahead. So I think, again, Paul Grant's the chair of the Dairy Growth Board, it would be really helpful for either members on an individual basis, because uh, Paul Grant's very familiar with the situation at First Milk, or, uh, or in the terms of the, the context of the committee, to speak to the Dairy Growth, growth Board uh, and Paul Grant about some of these issues. Okay. okay. Um, Graeme Day's got a supplementary in that, and Dave Thompson has as well. So... I think this one fits in. Th thank right. you, Kevin, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Just picking up on the, on the reference there to um, Graham's and this, this work that they're doing domestically. Last week, Robert Graham expressed some frustration at the fact that 85% of the spreadable butter that's sold in Scotland is imported, I think, from Denmark. Um, I think he highlighted that in an area that we should be looking to do something about. We also heard earlier today from Morrison's that there's a growth in salad cheeses and they're all, that, that um, demand has been satisfied from outside Scotland. What can we do to tap into the, uh, the butter market? And are salad cheeses an area that we should be looking to encourage expansion into so that we're, we're meeting that need domestically? Well, let's be frank here. It is pretty unacceptable that if you go into a retailer's in Scotland, you find the biggest selling yogurt is produced outside of Scotland, the biggest butter sold is produced outside of Scotland, and the best selling cheeses are produced outside of Scotland as well. I would find it surprising if you went into Italy or France or perhaps Denmark or some other countries in the world and found a similar situation the major retailers in those countries were selling foreign products as the number one sellers. 
I am fed up of going into Scottish retailers and seeing foreign cheeses emblazoned in front of your eyes at the end of aisle promotions. So we need more of that energy and activity from our retailers to display you know, loyalty towards our homegrown producers in this country, as retailers in other countries show to their homegrown producers. There have, of course, been examples of great progress from our retailers in Scotland sourcing more Scottish produce. But I think when it comes to dairy products in particular, we, uh, there are other product, products as well, we could perhaps have more effort from our retailers to promote homegrown produce in their Scottish stores. We hope that our produce is going to be in stores in the rest of the UK, and Graham's is a fantastic example that's expanding into other UK stores. We're not necessarily expecting Scottish produce to be the best sellers in other UK stores, but in Scottish stores, I think there's an expectation that an extra special effort would be possible by our retailers to get us to the position where hopefully some years down the line, because the products have got to be available in the first place, that the best-selling butter in Scotland is a Scottish butter, the best-selling cheese in Scotland is a Scottish cheese, and the best-selling yogurts in Scotland are Scottish yogurts. And I think that's possible, because we've got the, the companies who could uh, develop those products and get them onto the marketplace. But we need the retailers to hopefully give a bit more effort to ensuring their best-sellers in Scotland are from Scotland, just as in other countries, the best sellers quite often, not always, but quite often, are from their own countries. Uh, so I think the retailers have a, quite a lot of influence here, uh, and hopefully we can work with the retailers in the times ahead um, to get more Scottish produce onto Scottish shelves. Okay. Dave Thompson and then Jim Hume. Uh, thank you, convener. Uh, morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, just a point, it's not, not directly in your, your gift to, um, uh, you know, uh, give us an answer to this in the sense of being able to take any direct action on it, but uh, w our two witnesses earlier on this morning from uh, Asda and Morrison's both mentioned smoothing in terms of the tax regime and indicated that uh, farmers would benefit from a five-year smoothing uh, rather than a two-year smoothing, which I presume is, you know, the period over which they have to, to pay tax. And this would help cash flow because obviously one of the big issues and the big problems here is to do with the fluctuations in price and so on. And I would imagine that processors could probably benefit from a longer smoothing term as well. Now, these are obviously HMRC matters. Uh, it's the UK government. I just wonder if you would consider the comments they made this morning and um, consider maybe writing to the Chancellor, uh, you know, to advocate uh, some kind of uh, increased period for smoothing to help these businesses that are in a very volatile market to uh, deal with their, their prices over a longer period. <coughs> Clearly, in terms of some short-term help for the sector, that is one idea that's been put to the Scottish Government. And we have opened up a dialogue with the HMRC to convey our views that yeah. that should be looked at. And I'll take on board your request that we perhaps follow up in writing to, to UK ministers. I did, I'm sure, read or hear David Cameron, the Prime Minister, uh, in his uh, limited references to the dairy sector issues at the moment, actually address that particular point. So it would appear that the UK Government are alert to it and hopefully considering it at the current time. And, of course, I would urge them to be very sympathetic uh, to that request. Okay. Um, Jim Hume. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Th thanks very much, Cabinet Secretary. It was, it was more back to the point you were, you were making to, to Graham Day about supermarkets more, doing more uh, themselves to promote Scottish produce. But we did hear from Asda and Morrison that you know, some brands of butter it is the public that are going in there that are wanting those specific brands. And I'm trying not to mention them. Uh, <laughs> Uh, here today, but name them and shame them. <laughs> no, we can't, can't shame the shame the brands if if they yeah. if they're doing very well in other countries. Um, no, but just going back to New Zealand, which does have a brand of butter that is, sells very well here, and of course lamb as well uh, sells very well here sometimes. Um, not that it should, uh, <laughs> but there, uh, the actually was government that actually puts quite a lot of uh, focus and funds, I should say, in, into marketing, not just in their own area, but abroad. So, therefore, I just wonder, have we got that balance right uh, as a government uh, by 
perhaps we should be focusing more on helping with the marketing in our own area and abroad. Well, I can answer that question in a general sense in that with the food policy in Scotland, we have made significant inroads over the last few years. So the sales of Scottish brands across UK retailers, not just Scottish, has increased by around a third uh, since 2007. And that's worth tens of millions of pounds to the Scottish food sector. And, and, and most sectors will have benefited from that in some shape or form. <coughs> in terms of the Scottish brands, uh, clearly I am keen about what more we can do in this country to have more of a Scottish brand. And we've already mentioned the fact that we're developing a, a Scottish dairy brand. But all our products should benefit from coming under the umbrella of the Scottish food brand. And we are working on some ideas about how we can take that to the next level. Uh, clearly, we have to cooperate with all our, our levy bodies. We've got several of them. And we have begun to work closer together over the last few years and under the Scotland Food and Drink umbrella. So how we can make more of that opportunity of working together to develop a single brand overseas, in particular, a Scottish brand, so that we don't just get a premium for our whisky, a premium for our beef or salmon, and perhaps some other products, but we get a premium for the fact that all products that go into the international marketplace, if they're Scottish and meet the quality standards, they benefit from the Scottish brand. So I think there are some opportunities there. We're working at that at the moment. OK, thanks. Dave Thompson, I have a point to do. May I just, sorry, just, just Chairman, just briefly on I that, may I just, I may want to may just, just me, briefly, on, so just very briefly, I suppose, just to say, I, I'm conscious of the comment about the home game really matters, but I think the, just to come back to the export plans, the example of resources going into promotion, it's a really good model of, of collaboration in that we're, it's about four and, four and a bit million pounds, the plan, the export plan, of which, which the government's putting in the, the, the vast majority, but for the first time, the, the sectors put their hands in their own pockets. And it's a really good partnership developing on that. And so we want to work on that model, thinking of the UK market next. So we're building on that model. That's good. Um, Dave, and then... Uh, 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 thank you again, convener. Uh, again, we heard this morning, Cabinet Secretary, that um, certain producers, bigger producers, if they want to get their product uh, into the supermarkets will actually put forward when negotiations are taking place in relation to price and so on, a package of promotion of their products. Um, now this is obviously okay for larger producers who have got the cash to do that um, and, and that's maybe why you, you see these uh, shelf end promotions and all the rest of it. They're actually funded by these larger uh, producers. So if we're going to increase the market share of the smaller ones, who by definition aren't going to have the resources to, to do that and to compete with that, I just wonder if, there's, if you've given any consideration or will give some consideration to how support to the, the smaller producers and the brands could be provided. Otherwise, uh, given the nature of uh, business and so on, the larger producers are going to strike the best deal with the supermarkets and continue to hog the best places on, on the shelves. We do have grants which assist companies in marketing. I will double check as to whether exactly the kind of in-store promotions you're speaking about qualify for the current mm -hmm. grant system. So it's a good, I don't know the answer to that, so I have to check that. But you know, we, we have gone out our way to give grants on marketing. So I'll just double check. <clears throat> I think there's a wider question. I think the wider question is what has been refreshing in the last few years is our big retailers. And in Scotland, we have big retailers. Mm. It's not always the case in European countries, but in Scotland, we're different because we have big retailers. And we have seen some of them adopt policies to support local, and that is good. And I think consumers want to see that. The evidence is, is they'll even pay more for that. So that's going the right direction, more local sourcing. But when it comes to in-store promotions, I do ask myself if the retailers accept there's a case for more local, then of course they have it within their power to take a decision mm. to promote more local and not necessarily rely on the 
suppliers paying the fees for end of aisle promotions. The retailers could take a decision that the right thing to do in their stores in any one particular country is to give a bit of extra effort to promoting produce from that country in which the store is based. And that's what happens in many countries, and it's beginning to happen in Scotland, but I think it could happen a lot more. Mm -hmm. So yes, on the one hand, we, I think, you know, need to look at what support's available for suppliers to fund in-store promotions. But on the other hand, the retailers already, to a certain extent, promote local produce. But if they did a lot more of that, then the supplier wouldn't have to pay for it. Mm. Okay. okay. Uh, Angus MacDonald. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Good morning, Mr Strang. Um, if I could perhaps touch on a ring fencing <clears throat> of uh, milk quotas in, in certain areas. Um, my colleague Mike Russell earlier referred to one of the areas um, currently a ring fence for milk quotas, uh, which is, the, is classed as the Southern Isles, which includes Dura, Gia, Arran, Butte, Great Cumbria, Little Cumbria, the Kintyre Peninsula, South of Tarbert, and part of the Cowell Peninsula. Um, and I believe Orkney is also covered by ring fencing, except the island of Stronsey. Um, now, ring fencing of quotas was clearly introduced in 1984 for good reasons, uh, and some areas uh, of the islands have already been relieved of ring fencing uh, for, for some time. So if, um, if God forbid, but, but if for whatever reason uh, producers in the Southern Isles found their processors unable to take their milk, um, would the government consider lifting ring fencing arrangements for the, the Southern Isles and, if necessary, uh, the Orkney Islands? Well, <clears throat> I'd have to consider all the ramifications of, of going down that road. Uh, clearly, in terms of the quota system at European level, that's been phased out. So I'd have to understand the interaction between the ring fencing of quota and islands with the quota systems being phased out. I think it does raise a good question in terms of the original motivation of ring fencing of quota was to protect the islands. And therefore, if the quota system has been phased out, by default, that's less relevant, that measure. Uh, therefore, are there measures we should be looking at to give a bit of protection to island communities in terms of dairy production? So I don't have a ready answer to that. It's not something that any stakeholder has raised with me uh, so far from memory. So I would have to take that away and consider it. OK. OK. okay. Thank you. Um, the Grocery Code Adjudicator, Graham Day. Thanks. I, I just want to Cabinet Secretary how you view the remit of the Grocery Code Adjudicator as it currently stands, <coughs> whether you feel the remit and the powers are fit for purpose in relation to the dairy industry, and if not, how would you wish to see these changed? Well, it's good news that at long last we have the adjudicator in place because the government, with uh, much cross-party support in Parliament, uh, lobbied the UK government to set it up in the first place for many, many years, and it took a long time to get the adjudicator. We have now uh, the, the, the adjudicator in place, and... I heard a little bit of the evidence given to you by the retailers earlier on about the difference it's making to their operations. So it's slightly early days, but I do think there are some areas. I have some sympathy with the recommendations of the House of Commons Committee that looked into this just in the last few weeks and made some recommendations. So I have some sympathy for those recommendations. I have sympathy for uh, perhaps giving the... The, the adjudicator of the right to be more proactive in terms of her investigations and also to perhaps take r referrals from uh, indirect sources for investigations as opposed to the direct supplier affected. It could be another organisation giving the referral for investigation. So I, I do think these should be seriously looked at and I'd be sympathetic for expanding our powers in that regard. I'm actually due to hopefully meet the adjudicator in the next few weeks and dairy will be on the agenda, so I'm requesting to meet her, and I'll be keen to have her feedback about her experience so far uh, in the job. There were, of course, some original concerns when the adjudicator was set up about perhaps the lack of penalties and clout the adjudicator has, so that still remains a live issue, should she have more powers in terms of enforcement and penalties. Uh, and I guess the final part of the debate is should her powers be extended beyond retailers mm -hmm. to other parts of the supply chain? 
<coughs> Again, I don't think we should rule that out, but I do have some sympathy for some of the comments you heard from the retailers, which is, you know, the commercial world is a very complex web, <laughs> and the adjudicator, I guess, to some extent, has to be focused in what she's doing to make a difference. So it'd be a bit low if suddenly, you know, expanding powers and not understanding what the unintended consequences are. Uh, so I'm sympathetic to looking at how that could operate in other parts of the supply chain, not just the retailers, the code. But clearly, it could be, become so unfocused that you know it doesn't mm -hmm. have any impact yeah. if we do that. So I'd have to understand that better. Okay, thank you for that. Jim Hume. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, convener, just, uh, just on the grocery co code adjudicator, um, you, we very well, much welcomed it. Of course, it was part of the Lib Dem manifesto, not that I want to get too, uh, too political, but just... Um, just to bring you up to date slightly, Westminster just yesterday events cable uh, laid powers uh, down that the grocery code adjudicator can actually fine up to 1% of the turnover of specific um, supermarkets. I wonder if that was something that the Cabinet Secretary welcomed and his colleagues would perhaps support. Uh, oh, yes, clearly I support the adjudicator having penalties. Uh, there's also a debate as to whether 1% is the right figure, but it's a start. Absolute. And I would say, of course, given the current climate, uh, and uh, financial issues facing our large retailers, I'm sure that will make them think twice okay. about not uh, behaving appropriately, mm -hmm. given that 1% of turnover these days is perhaps having more of an impact than what it might have been a few years ago because of the tight margins that the, the retailers are now experiencing compared to mm -hmm. before. Okay, thanks. I'm, I'm thinking about uh, the voluntary code that's existed between producers and processors. Um, are you content with the way that this voluntary code is working in Scotland and whether you think uh, changes to the code would help the current climate faced by the dairy industry in Scotland? Well, I think it is quite challenging to understand to what extent the current issues being faced by the dairy sector in Scotland relate to the voluntary code being weak or otherwise. Because quite clearly, as we discussed before, there's there's European-wide factors, there's global factors, and irrespective of what the voluntary code has been like, these factors still be there. So we can't see this exact correlation between the weakness or otherwise of the code and what's happening just now. Uh, clearly, Alec Ferguson is one of your committee members sitting there, uh, much more expert on these issues than I am because he carried out the review of the voluntary code. And I think Alec Ferguson made some valid points in his own uh, report in that the voluntary code has had some positive impact and uh, clearly there were some comments from Alec in his uh, recommendations about how we could perhaps investigate other ways of tightening up some aspects of the code or extending it. I think very much it's not always just for ministers to sit back and, and lay down the law in terms of voluntary code. There's dialogue taking place between the farming unions and the processors and I think what's important is what emerges from these di dialogues and then ministers can reflect upon that. One issue I have raised in the past is should we be thinking about the retailers using the code in terms of who they give their contracts to? So if players in the industry are not signed up to the codes, should that be taken into account by the retailers? I've not got a fixed view on that. I think it's something that's worthy of debate because quite clearly there are some companies that argue that the code is not appropriate for them. It's a voluntary code. It's not a statute-based code. So I think we have to think carefully about going down that road. But I think there are some debates to be had there, and no doubt these debates will happen amongst the various stakeholders as they speak to each other. And uh, I reserve the right, of course, as Minister, to, to intervene in the future if we do feel there is a case for doing something differently. Would you agree that it seems to have built up some more trust as a result of having the voluntary code between processors and producers? Well, I think it's certainly the case that the producers are more empowered than what they were before through the voluntary code. Again, that raises some debates as to some of the companies perhaps think the, the, the power given to the, the co-ops has put them at a disadvantage, uh, particularly given the current climate in the dairy sector where the, the producers are able to have notice and the companies perhaps feel they can't react quickly enough to changing international prices. So there's a whole range of factors in it that have to be considered. But I do think that the primary producers have been more empowered by the voluntary codes. 
We asked uh, the supermarkets earlier, you know, if they thought that uh, they should be included as retailers into the voluntary code. And uh, one of them suggested, of course, that there's a grocery code already. And they didn't think it was particularly appropriate. Do you think that the extending the voluntary code to the actual retailers would be a good thing? Well, <clears throat> what I think is that there are some issues with the retailers and the dairy sector. And I think the first thing to do is identify those issues and then work out what's the best way of dealing with those issues. Is it the groceries code? Is it a voluntary code? What's the best way? But I think there are some issues that we should perhaps draw out and maybe the committee is doing that as part of your deliberations. So at the moment, for instance, it's quite murky to understand how all the contracts work within the dairy sector and the retailers. So we can see tweets or comment from some of the retailers about the good deals they're giving the primary producers. But of course, it then transpires that only applies to some of the primary producers and some of the dairy farmers. And those that are not in contracts or not within the supermarket pool don't get those prices. And so it's all quite murky. And I would like to see more of a light shined on those arrangements so that we all understand not just what applies to milk, but what applies to cheese and yogurts and the other products, and not what just applies to those farmers who are in a select pool of suppliers to the retailer, but also the retailers buying spot market milk and milk from wider commodity markets. So what conditions apply to those suppliers in those markets? So I think there's a case for shining more of a light on that, and I think we have to give some thought as to whether it's the, the grocery uh, adjudicator or whether it's voluntary codes that perhaps shines that light. Mike Russell. Um, you may have missed the evidence from Morrison's and Asta that started this morning, but <coughs> they were at considerable pains to say that they didn't set the price of milk, it was done by processors, uh, and essentially they were far more interested in things like distribution costs than the actual price of milk. From what you're saying, I think you're indicating you don't necessarily believe that that's the case, that there are issues about the attitude of supermarkets towards uh, the primary producers, which require to be resolved? Well, I think if we want fairness across the supply chain, there are retailers are clearly doing very good things with some of their suppliers, and I don't deny that for a second. But if it transpires, that's only a small proportion of their suppliers. <laughs> By definition, it doesn't apply to the rest of their suppliers. And therefore, those standards, those standards that are perhaps being met you know, if it's in the public interest or the interests of fairness that all milk producers are getting a good deal and the retailers paying attention to the deal that all suppliers are getting, then that will get us to a better place. Yeah, to, to, be, to be entirely accurate, what they were saying this morning was that the price of milk was a matter for the processor, not for themselves. I find that a surprising remark. I found it surprising this morning. I still find it surprising. Uh, presumably, we, you would see a connection, obviously, between what the supermarkets are selling milk at and the price that the producers are getting. Well, th this takes us into a, a very interesting debate <laughs> because it is a commercial world in which we live, and quite clearly the retailer buys their milk off the, the processor or whoever, and not necessarily direct to the producer, albeit there are arrangements to make sure the producer gets a good price with some of the specific arrangements that some retailers have. Uh, but saying that in other walks of life in the commercial world in this day and age, we are not just looking at the immediate relationship between one part of the supply chain, we're looking at the whole of the supply chain. So in other words, the ethical thing to do these days more than ever before is to look at the conditions of the workers, for instance, that you're contracting to, but then you take it beyond that and ask your contractor to make sure that the subcontractor is getting in good conditions as well, and it goes right down the supply chain. So the ethics of the modern day commercial world is not just between the, the retailer and the processor, but we should be looking at right down this whole supply chain. Um, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Good morning to you as well, um, Mr Strang. Uh, I, I'd like us to explore a bit about the producer organisation model 
um, because in some member states, um, as you'll know, Cabinet Secretary, these have been formed um, by dairy farmers, and um, the EF EFRA report states um, that, the, and I quote, the UK government believes that forming a producer organisation could give dairy farmers, and I quote again, greater clout in the marketplace. Um, and I, I, I note from our, from our information that we've received um, in relation to the dairy industry and the concerns that everyone has that um, the Scottish Government had an action plan in 2012 and that um, it was a five-point dairy action plan and that the fifth one, which I'll read out just to remind um, and for the record, um, sought to ensure that the Scottish Agricultural Organisation Society, um, commonly known as SOAS, um, have sufficient resources to accelerate their existing work on producer organisations and cooperatives. Um, and I wonder if um, you have any comments on either how that's going forward or whether you see that as, as a way forward, bearing in mind the comments um, that were made to us last week by, um, by Robert Graham about um, small producers as well, but whether this would perhaps correct the balance in some way? What we said a couple of years ago and what we continue to say, which is a key feature of the debate about empowering primary producers, is that we want to support producers working together. And ultimately it's up to the producers themselves how they want to work together. Mm -hmm. And we said, as you quite rightly point out in our, our, our policy, that we will support farmers that want to form producer organisations, POs. And I think I remember we made some resource available for that, and I think there's a new association that started in South West Scotland, and therefore it's very much in the hands of the producers to what extent they want to work together. But clearly to empower the primary producer, the more they do work together via cooperatives or producer organisations, then they have the potential to get a better deal. So it's something we support and will help facilitate, but it's ultimately up to the producers to what extent they want to work together and what form that takes, because clearly under European legislation, producer organisations have some red tape and bureaucracy yeah. and, you know, uh, legal status, and perhaps that's not appropriate for some farmers. Right, and could I I'd just uh, connect that, I hope, um, seamlessly with a point that was made earlier by um, Morrison's uh, this morning in evidence that we heard uh, about the suggestion that um, uh, that it would be it might be a way forward for farmers, for dairy farmers, to be hedging uh, for um, for prices, uh, and and that that might help them in the future. Which was something that I I was quite surprised by, and I wonder whether you've got any comment on that, particularly in view of the fact that small um, producers, one would think, would hardly have the time to get into the hedge fund sort of uh, area of. Um, of world markets. I, f I found it quite an odd um, suggestion, but that's just my own perspective on it. Well, clearly one of the advantages of our producer organisation from the producer's point of view is that they have representatives working on their behalf mm -hmm. because they're working together and they'll jointly employ people to do what's best for the, the members of the producer organisation. So that's clearly an option. Uh, the there's other issues, I think, that have arisen as part of the debate over the last few weeks to do with planning for the future that dairy farmers are being encouraged to do. Mm -hmm. Because clearly, I think I saw some evidence you received as a committee from, I think it's a levy paying body, Dairy Co, in the last week or two, that who I think the representative said to you that global trends mm. for dairy prices show that every two and a half years there's a, a mm. you know, a in a trough or whatever, and therefore farmers can look at the last 10 years and look at the fact this does happen, and therefore when they're doing their plans, they can anticipate that there's potential mm -hmm. for a downturn in prices every couple of years or whatever the, 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 the time scale may be. So I think farmers, yes, have to plan for the future and understand the cyclical markets they're in. Whether hedge funds is the, the argument, uh, the answer to that, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, there's certainly a principle there about planning for the future. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, Graham Day. Just a, a point, Cabinet Secretary. If we were to go down the producer organisation route, 
Would the Scottish Government and its agencies oversee that directly? Because I'm, I'm just thinking of the example some years ago where the producer organisations in the soft fruit sector were overseen by the RPA th uh, on behalf of DEFRA, and uh, you're well aware of the difficulties that arose from that. <coughs> yes, I thought you might mention the soft fruit sector. <laughs> you wouldn't represent Angus by any chance, would you? Uh, well, that's all laid down in European legislation, the producer organisations and how they're governed and monitored. And as you said before, the RPA have a, a role formally on behalf of the member state, the UK, mm. in relation to producer organisations. So I can't specifically answer the question as to whether that would change in terms of whether the Scottish Government have a greater role. Uh, however, it's laid down in European legislation, mm. so I'd expect it would be a similar arrangement. Okay. The only thing I was the only thing I was going to add, thank you, is um, learning the best we can from what's happening right now. And to mention the work with producers done by the SEOS right now, which um, you alluded to, uh, in terms of, of First Milk and Campbelltown. Uh, what is the issue around Campbelltown? There are lots of different actions that could be taken there, but including with the producers. So getting the producers together in the Campbelltown context and learning from that. I think it's really important that we, that we work with SEOS to learn the lessons from what's happening right now. And one of them will be about how producers can work together better. Okay. Yep. Yeah. It's, it's interesting that uh, I hope my figures are right, but I think pig farmers in Scotland that are, are consider certainly the majority of them. I, I thought it was ninety percent, but I, I stand corrected if I'm wrong. Um, are are involved with a producer organisation, and and I wonder why that hasn't developed in the dairy industry, and, and what you know what's holding that back specifically in dairy. It's just. I float the question. <laughs> well, the, you're right in that the, the pig sector are very highly organised mm. and they cooperate very closely. Mm. And they're very successful at doing that, especially over the last year or two where yeah. things have improved quite a lot for the, the, for the pig sector. Historically, why is that not the case in the dairy sector? Uh, it's a good question. It's clearly a different sector, therefore it's different dynamics at work. And primary producers in the dairy sector uh, will go off and have a contract with a different processor. And sometimes it may be quite difficult to keep them all together. Uh, so it's just, it's just a different profile to the sector. Right. Okay. Frank Strang, yeah. Okay. Uh, all I was going to say is a lot, so a lot of this is cultural ultimately for a sector and um, I guess one of the key issues for us is that everybody has a bit in this story as to how we, how we promote, uh, improve things uh, and we are in the new um, SRDP going to have new um, advisory services, new um, uh, knowledge transfer and <coughs> we've got a whole farm review and we said we're going to prioritise dairy within whole farm reviews but we can do as much of that as we want if we can encourage the, the farming community to come forward and the more we can do working with the NFUS to encourage take up of, of advisory services and, and the cultural change that's required. Okay, um, Alec Ferguson. Um, thank you very much convener. Um, I, I want to go back really to where the Cabinet Secretary first started um, in your opening remarks because nobody we've spoken to disagrees with what you said that the long term prospects for the dairy industry are positive and, and good and you know that's we, we all need, we, we need to keep focused on that I think through through this period of time. Um, James Withers told us that, that that we need to invest in processing. Um, which accords with your view quite rightly that we need to add value to the, to the basic product. Um, First Milk argued that Scotland is light on dairy processing. Graham Jack from Willow Wiseman said we don't have enough processing capacity. And behind all that, Graham, Robert Graham said in written evidence that one of the problems he's come up against um, and a particular barrier to the investment that company is trying to make, um, it, it comes through the planning process. Um, and my question is really, um, I mean, I'm sure you do agree that we, we, we could use more processing capacity, um, but I just wonder what you feel about the, the barriers to, to that investment that people put to us last week, and also what the Scottish Government do maybe through the planning process to try to, to fast-track any investment that is, uh, is likely to come into the country. 
Well, there's two issues. Firstly, there's the issue that Graham's raised with you, and secondly, there's how do we attract more investment into Scotland for processing capacity. Clearly, when we have a company like Graham's, which is a family-owned company based in Scotland, uh, ambitious for Scotland, and doing ex what they do extremely well, I would hope that we can all rally around companies like that in this country and support them. Of course, there's a planning system in place, and that has to be uh, adhered to, but in terms of policy, I'm sure our local authorities, Scottish Government, you know, it's important we take into account the economic benefits of supporting companies like Graham, which are owned here and which are expanding and doing well and have big plans. Uh, <clears throat> so I can't comment on to what extent the Scottish Government would intervene in a planning <coughs> issue uh, such as what's happening in Stirling just now with Graham's. I can only put it into the context of wanting to support Indigenous companies expanding, and particularly in dairy at the moment, it's very important that we do that. And yes, clearly, if companies do want to invest in Scotland and establish processing plants, the Scottish Government would be very, very keen to work with such companies, to support such companies, and ensure that we're bringing everyone else around the table, including the planning authorities and their enterprise agencies, to try and make those projects happen and happen as quickly as possible. So while we'd be very keen to um, ex expedite the process where possible, uh, and that's that's something we'd encourage. Clearly, it's in the hands of local authorities, but there's a case just now in Peterhead where they're seeking to rebuild the pelagic factory that burnt down uh, a few weeks ago. And just as all the agencies are getting together there around the table to say, let's get this rebuilt as soon as possible so we can keep people in jobs and keep the, the macro process in Peterhead, that's a major economic player in the area, I would hope a similar attitude would be adopted if that's for a new build in uh, Scotland or inward investment coming into the country. Can I just continue that a little bit, Kavita? Thank you very much for, the, for that response. Um, you, you mentioned the possible development of the Scottish dairy brand also in your opening remarks, and I wonder if you see the development of that brand as a, as a, as a magnet for investment, and if that is the case, who, who is out there sort of um, using that magnet, if I can put it that way, to attract investment in, into processing facilities in the yeah. country? Well, we should be optimistic. There are some signs that some companies are looking at Scotland's potential inward investment opportunities for dairy. So that's a healthy sign. It should give us confidence. Yeah. Clearly, I can't sit here as Minister and say they're definitely going to happen or give you a time scale. But we are beginning conversations with some companies that do appear interested in Scotland. And you're quite right that the, the brand plays a big role in that. Scotland is seen as a good place to invest, particularly in the food sector. You know, it's well documented, as we've discussed in the committee many times, that our food and drink industry is doing well. And we have a premium brand in the international marketplace. And that, that can pay dividends. So that's certainly helping attract companies to consider Scotland as a potential investment location. And that also applies to dairy, which is good news. Good. Thank you. And Sarah Boyack. Follow Thanks on. very much, Convener. Um, it's really just to follow on that issue about branding and marketing. Um, it's obviously an issue in terms of exports. Um, and we got submission from the NFUS um, calling for um, immediate and direct support for marketing and branding of Scottish dairy products. Um, we also had it from retailers as well, the Scottish Retail Consortium and the Cooperative Food. Um, both of them advocated the benefits that would come from clearer branding and clearer marketing. And... Um, it was also suggested that public procurement could play a, an important role in terms of brand development. So we're really going to want to focus on that in terms of public procurement. Um, it's something we've debated a lot in the Parliament. Um, it's a huge market. Any thoughts the Cabinet Secretary has on how you could do more to promote public procurement that would use Scottish dairy produce and the extent to which the brand would help us there? It's a, it's a good question about how we use the brand in terms of public procurement, and I will certainly give that a lot more thought. But at the moment, what we are doing is we are increasing our public procurement for Scottish produce, and that includes dairy. I mean, virtually all our liquid milk, as you can imagine, is from Scotland, and uh, over half of our other dairy products are, are Scottish, and I'd like to see that rise. It's a lot better than what it was before, 
but it's a lot better than what's happening in retailers, <laughs> where it's a lot less than half of our dairy products are Scottish. So <clears throat> we are uh, working on that. And I do think there's opportunities for us to do a lot more, and we are thinking actively about that to give you some confidence. Mm -hmm. And as you know, we have adopted the food charter, uh, or at least formulated the food chapter, which has so far been adopted by, for instance, the Commonwealth Games and the Ryder Cup, particularly successful at the Ryder Cup, but also successful at the Games. And we are now considering how to extend the food charter across the public sector, across Scotland. So not just the public sector, the private sector as well. And I think the Food Charter gives us a great platform for, for that, that brand promotion. So there's a wee bit more thinking being done at the moment about that, so I don't have a, a exact details for you. But yes, just to agree with you, it's a, it's a lot of potential there. And if we were to get all the public sector in Scotland and hopefully the private sector signed up to the Food Charter, that would make a huge difference to local sourcing, including to the dairy sector. And can I extend that to talk a bit about the catering industry more generally? Because those big events, um, public procurement is important, but a lot of it will be private procurement, <coughs> um, company subcontracting. We've got a very big event. Catering industry um, from the private side would probably be hugely important. Are there any particular issues that you're following up there to encourage private catering industry to source Scottish? And particularly thinking about some of the premium branding issues we've talked about earlier. Um, you know, salad, cheese. You know, when that was explained to me, I thought I, that's what I buy. So it's some of the terminology. It's actually thinking of what people are, are wanting. So those products are not necessarily available in Scotland. So that, that again links back into how do you promote more processing opportunities and then make sure you've got a buy up for it. Yes, and I was actually discussing that with officials this morning because I fund something called Sourcing for Success whereby we are trying to work with companies to source their ingredients. This is more the manufacturing sector, where they source their ingredients from Scotland, because ironically we have some major food manufacturing companies in Scotland, and f some of us go around their factories, and sometimes you go around and you ask them where they get their onions from, or where they get their other raw materials before the ready meal is produced. And often they would be open to taking a lot more of that from Scotland on their own doorstep, but are not doing it, so we've got a Sourcing for Success initiative, and we're looking at continuing that, uh, because we've had that going for the last couple of years. Uh, and I, I think, in terms of the catering companies, the Food Charter at the Ryder Cup, for instance, influenced the catering companies and the food service companies in terms of what they're sourcing from Scotland. So that's why I think there's a lot of untapped potential there. 50% of the food we eat comes from the food service companies. So people think most of the food we get is from the retailers, the supermarkets, mm -hmm. but 50% of what we eat as a country comes from the food service sector. I also want to just give a big advert for Ontier, run by Peter Bruce, who is a former chef who started his own company in 2008 in North East Scotland. If I recall, he, in, over that short space of time, has built up his turnover to £46 million. He's now one of the biggest food service companies supplying the offshore industry in Scotland. And he told me that he, despite being told he couldn't afford to do it, he now sources 70% of the food he serves in Scotland from Scotland. So it's local produce, mainly North East companies. And I met some of the companies when I visited his premises a few weeks ago in Aberdeen. Local food suppliers there supplying a food service company who are now one of the biggest in Scotland and who've got a £46 million turnover built up over just since 2008 when he started the company. So that is the sort of food service company. It shows it can be done and is exactly aligned with Scotland's food policy. And, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a great entrepreneur. Uh, and, you know, we must support companies like that. So he's showing the way it can be done. Yeah, I, th I think proving that it works and showing other people how it works is hugely important. Can I just sneak in a, a question about um, organic food? Because we're on procurement. That's one of the um, key objectives <coughs> in Food for Life. And we had a very good event here in the Parliament last night that we were all at. Um, have you been monitoring the impact of 
change in terms of volatility on organic produce in terms of dairy and how that's faring in what's a really uncertain uh, market? That's a good question. I'm not aware of any recent statistics I've had on, uh, well, I have in milk, wider dairy I would have to investigate. But the price I understand has been paid for organic milk, uh, I was told as recently as last night at the Food for Life event, is 40 pence mm -hmm. per litre compared to 23, 22, 20, or some some cases of 26 pence in the in the conventional milk market. So there's clearly a good premium there for organic milk at 40 pence, and therefore there's an opportunity for some milk producers who wish to convert to organic there because they'll get 40 pence at current prices compared to what they're getting. So it's a good issue to highlight. I, I, I confess I'm not completely up to date with other dairy products, and I'll have to investigate It'd that. It'd be really helpful to get a, just a brief note on both the the product side, yeah. but also milk. <coughs> I think we do appreciate that. <coughs> yep. Thank you. Just, just very brief for me. Thank you very much. Um, uh, just to say, really grateful for that question, the first question about the food service, because um, with all the focus on retail, if you look at numbers, the food service is so important, the public sector is really important, so that's really good uh, to raise that issue. I think um, from our point of view, and, and there are issues there incidentally about the transparency of where food servicing sources, that's much harder to get in, in, in amongst, so we are, we are very interested in that. A um, couple of things to say on um, that when we do showcasing Scotland activity I alluded to earlier on, we're not just interested in overseas buyers or retail, we're really interested in, in food service um, and, and actually in this, in this year of food and drink, we're interested in the tourism, uh, tourism catering world very much. Um, and the only other thing I would say is we are working um, with, in the public Sorry, sector with the local authorities that assist their, their catering people, particularly thinking about August as the year of, um, the, the, the month theme is delicious dairy, so what can we do around um, schools and dairy uh, in August? So. So I take it that the country of origin labelling issue, you know, crops up, whether it comes through supermarkets, in restaurants, uh, from caterers and all the rest of it, and that that would obviously be a part of uh, our means to actually alert the customer to where the product comes from. Yes, and it's part of our becoming a good food nation policy, which has been developed just now in the next stage of our national food policy. Clearly, there's an emphasis on serving good food as well as people buying good food. And clearly, we need good labelling for that to happen. And there are a couple of issues, I guess, to mention quickly. Firstly, we have been saying to the UK government for a long time now to extend what's happening in Europe to dairy produce. So whereas the, the labelling regulations have extended to... Uh, other different types of meats uh, and other products that have not been extended to dairy yet. I think that's next in the pipeline, and we're urging Europe to extend the labelling requirements to dairy produce. So that's something hopefully will move forward shortly. Secondly, of course, the Smith Commission recommended that the UK government should work with the Scottish government to promote a Made in Scotland label, or at least the country of origin labelling legislation should apply to Scotland and give us the ability to have a Made in Scotland label or whatever we choose to call it. So country of origin labelling is very, very important as well. And if we are very um, keen for the UK government to act as quickly as possible on that recommendation to work with the Scottish government to give us the right for country of origin labelling. Thank you. Um, that's helpful for us uh, just from the overall view of uh, food consumption. Um, Dave Thompson's got a short... Supplementary uh, on this. Yeah, thank you, uh, convener. Um, it's just a very short point. Uh, you know, there are lots of schools and places like that where they have breakfast clubs because some children come to school without breakfast, and it's it's not good for their ability to learn if they come to school on an empty stomach. And I just wonder um, if if we couldn't be looking at providing a mid-morning uh, flavoured milk, yogurt break for kids. You know, which would uh, help the kids. Uh, it, it would uh, give them a bit more nutrition in the middle of the morning. I remember well when I was at school a long time ago the, the milk, the daily milk that we that we got. Sometimes it was good and sometimes it wasn't so good and sometimes it was better. Uh, it, it varied, but we could make it very attractive. As I say, we, we could have flavoured milk, we could have yogurts and things and give this to the children mid-morning and I'm sure it would help them 
physically and mentally, and it would help the industry as well. But not bubblegum flavoured milk. <laughs> <coughs> given Asler's comment earlier on today, which I heard in the monitor, about it not being very popular. Uh, well, I, I'm, you know, clearly anything we can do to encourage uh, our, our children to enjoy healthy dairy produce uh, is something that I would be keen to investigate. I would just say two things. Firstly, we are actively looking as part of the plan that we will publish about how to publicise the health benefits of dairy more. So we're looking at some initiatives on that at the moment. That's more of a generic promotion in Scotland. Mm -hmm. There's been a, a, a belief that for some time that we've not been publicising the health benefits of dairy enough. So it seems now is an opportune time to look at that. So that's one aspect. Uh, the second aspect, as I mentioned earlier on, the refreshing of Scotland's food policy, becoming a good food nation. And one of the reasons why I'm keen to refresh it is I want children's food policy to be at the heart of it. So we're going to be doing a lot of work on a children's food policy. So your comment is very relevant to a children's food policy. So whilst I don't have a quick answer to how easy it would be to do that in our schools, uh, that would require quite clearly other ministers to be involved in those discussions, I can assure you that the children's food policy is going to be very prominent within our new national food policy. So there will be lots of room and scope for those debates. Mm -hmm. I, I just feel that um, if you introduce youngsters to um, good quality foods at a young age, then they're much more likely to enjoy these foods for the, the rest of their days, you know, the rest of their lives. So it's, uh, and it's something where, you know, we, uh, you know, uh, the, the government can have an input. So I welcome your comments and look forward to hearing how you propose to take this forward. Thanks. That's a, a very interesting suggestion. I hope some of the press are picking this up. You know, return the milk to the schools. Well, there we are. That's a historic uh, issue to discuss. Um, we've got a question about EU action at the moment. I think to, to round this up from Angus Macdonald. Um, you, you mentioned earlier, uh, Cabinet Secretary, that you'd asked the UK to raise the issue. Um, with the European Council and also the, the Council of Ministers. Um, clearly, if you can keep the committee updated on discussions uh, taking place in Europe, that would uh, be appreciated. Um, there have been suggestions that an increase in the intervention price uh, for milk would be a good short-term measure to ease the, the pressure on Scottish dairy farmers. Uh, do you think that's a realistic short-term solution? Uh, given that the intervention price is currently 17 pence per litre, which can go as low as 15 pence per litre when uh, currency exchange rate fluctuations are taken into account? Well, the view I took at the recent Council of Ministers was that Europe should have an open mind about raising the intervention price and that the Commission should be asked to analyse what the impact would be and look at the case for doing it. So, keeping an open mind because I don't know if it would make a material difference, but I was very keen for the Commission to take away from the Council a commitment to look at it and look at it, you know, as I said, analyse what the consequences would be. <coughs> it, was, it was very clear the UK Government did not support that position. <laughs> so, you know, we're not the Member State, and I, I put the position to the, to the UK and other Member States raised it with the Commission at the Council of Ministers. Uh, the... The, the Commissioner, likewise, was quite clearly not that keen to look at it too seriously at this stage. Uh, he was focused on extending storage aid. And, of course, other issues we were asking to be addressed was opening up new markets for exports around the world. So these sort of initiatives seem to be in the mix. I think the intervention price clearly wasn't getting a lot of support from the Commission or, indeed, the UK government, for that matter. So... Uh, I don't think it's completely ruled out in terms of where this will go, but clearly there's no urgency in terms of looking at the intervention price in Europe. Uh, so I, I do support, as you can imagine, the other measures that are being taken. Storage aid is playing a role, hopefully, in that it gives an option for taking some produce off the market in Europe, whether it's we're being flooded with dairy produce because of the Russian import ban and less demand from China and elsewhere. So that is available. And... Clearly, new markets is always welcome because we want to up our exports in this country as well. 
Um, so that's in terms of that's where that debate reached within Europe. Okay, thank you. I should say that the my 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 feeling was the commissioner feels that this is a temporary downturn, and he appears to be of the view that there'll be an upturn. To be fair to the commissioner, I noticed a newsletter from one of the the traders uh, this morning, which uh, Frank helpfully acquired for me. And as of well, the 3rd of February, it's dated, and it says that the price for Westbury milk powder has just increased by 18% over the last two weeks. And the trader's view is that there is now more than a glimmer of light, light that global and EU prices have bottomed out. So there's some tentative signs there that perhaps there's a slight upturn coming in prices. I don't have much to read into this. Clearly, we have to closely pay attention to this, but at least it's going in the right direction and not continuing in the wrong direction. So we can perhaps take a little bit of comfort from the, the traders' uh, view of things today. Thanks very much for that. Um, the more we understand about the dairy industry, the less we understand about the dairy industry. <laughs> but uh, we are um, benefiting tomorrow from speaking to the grocery code adjudicator and uh, some... Uh, slightly more reluctant retail uh, majors that are coming in to speak to us, but uh, I'm glad to say that many of them are coming. Um, we have one other short item just now, uh, which is about public bodies' consent memorandum, and then we're going to private. But I'd like to thank the witnesses just now. Uh, we're uh, no doubt going to get some more notes from you on certain of the points that were raised during this. So thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you. Look forward to the report. Yep. Um, so uh, we move on to the public bodies consent memorandum. Third agenda item today considers the Scottish Government memorandum relating to the public bodies abolition of advisory committees on pesticides order 2015 draft. This is the UK instrument and the Scottish Parliament must give its um, consent to the order. I refer members to the paper and invite members to decide whether the committee agrees to recommend to the Parliament and the, that the draft motion as set out in the public body consent memorandum is approved. Are we agreed? We are agreed. Thank you very much. Um, we now move into private, pointing out that, as I say, next uh, tomorrow we'll be dealing with the grocery code uh, adjudicator and other major retailers, and uh, we'll now clear the public gallery and move into private. Thank you.